Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar presentation, Introduction to Singing and Conducting Gregorian Chant, sponsored by the National Catholic Educational Association, American Federation Pueri Cantores, and our Sunday Visitor Institute. I am Scott Mathias, webmaster with NCEA, and I am happy to be your moderator and host today. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. I want to particularly point out the yellow certific certification widget. This is where you can download your certificate of attendance during the session. You may also want to try the group chat widget in blue to comment to each other during the webcast. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later by email. Please know we do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or bookmark any links that you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Let us begin as we do all things in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Jenny Donaldson, Associate Professor and Director of Sacred Music at St. Joseph's Seminary. Welcome, Jenny, and thank you for being here today. Everyone, I hope you can hear me just fine. Thank you for joining us today. I wanted to say especially thank you to Pori Contouris, um, Jan Schmidt, and the staff there, and also here at uh, NCEA, NCEA. Um, I'm, this is my first webinar, so um, I'm excited to try this, and the, this platform has been really exciting, and I hope that you'll um, get a lot out of today's presentation. To begin, I'd like to give you a, a brief overview of what today will look like. We'll start with a, an introduction to pneumatic notation. So for some of you, this will be a review, um, and we'll just do that a, a little bit at the beginning. And then we'll move into an introduction to the classical solemn rhythmic method, uh, a way of understanding rhythm um, that was developed primarily by Dom André Macaro at the Abbey of St. Peter in Solem, France. And um, then we will look at some basic chironomic gestures. Chironomy is, is a, a word that means uh, conducting of chant here. And then we will uh, go through a series of exercises, and it will culminate in the conducting of Kyrie 11 uh, from Mass 11 Orbis Factor. At the end, we'll briefly touch on tips and tricks for helping you uh, teach young singers how to understand the conducting that you are developing and how to sing expressively with it. But I think you'll find that the method of conducting is something that really, uh, without words, encourages expressive singing and good phrasing. And I'll give you a few resources for further study. And you'll also see in the webinar that I've given you a couple of conducting exercises that you can try after today. Um, we won't go through absolutely every exercise today during the webinar, just for the sake of time. 
but you'll have some things that you can try on your own. And then there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. To begin, let's just look at some basics of pneumatic notation. By pneumatic notation, I mean square note notation. There's another way of saying it. And we have a staff with four lines rather than five lines that you might be used to in modern notation. And we have two different clefs. One is the C clef or the DO clef. And the C clef can be on various lines. Most commonly, it's on the top line, the second line from the top, or the third line from the top. We can also have a fa clef, and uh, this just shows you where fa is. And the most common positions for the fa clef are on the second line from the top or the second line from the bottom. And these clefs show you how the notes in a movable dough system lie on the staff. So here you see we have a movable dough clef um, on the top line. And so that tells me that the note on the very top line is dough, and we can count backwards from that. And just like uh, you may have learned in your sight reading classes or music classes, there's a half step between mi and fa and ti and do. Now, when I say movable do, not only is the clef movable, but whatever pitch you would like to use is movable. So do could be anything uh, at all based on the range of your singers, what sounds good for them. For young singers, it's usually better to uh, start with something having your lowest note be something like D or perhaps E flat. Um, and for other singers, it might be something much different. So for example, if we look at this uh, staff, we have, um, and let's take C as Do. We would have Do, Re, Mi, Fa, so, La, Si, Do, or we could take it at B flat as Do. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, so, La, Si, Do, Re, Mi, Fa. Here we have an example of the clef on the second line from the top. So you see here, now Do is on the second line from the top, which means my lowest note in the range here is Mi. You might also see notes lower than that using ledger lines, just like in modern notation, and notes above using also ledger lines. And you see when you look at the staff that you have to kind of look for where is the half step. For example, in this class, the half steps are between me and fa, like usual, which is the lowest spot here indicated, and the bottom line, t and do, the middle space, up to the second line from the top, and then me and fa, are the top line up to the space right above that. We can also look at the same thing in a fa clef. Fa indicating, or the, the clef here indicating where fa is. So you see the different outline here. I've introduced something new in this slide as well, the flat sign. So um, in Gregorian chant, uh, the only flat that you'll see is on t, which makes it t. So if we have um, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, perhaps starting on this pitch. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Or we can change it with the use of the flat sign to te. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, A flat in Gregorian chant lasts one of two lengths. It's either until the end of the word or until the next bar line, whichever comes first. It's like a, uh, the warranty on your car, the 10,000 miles or, or two-year warranty, whichever comes first. Let's move now to the basics of some of the notation, the notes that you'll actually see in pneumatic notation. The sort of atomic level of this is the punctum. And here you'll notice on these next few slides that I've included a, an indication of what I'm talking about in modern notation, if you're familiar with that. But I think what you'll discover as we get more familiar with this sort of notation throughout the webinar is that it helps you to sing more expressively by looking at the pneumatic notation, perhaps rather than the uh, modern notation.
So the way that you might see a single soul or law indica indicated by a punctum is given in the middle. And um, I've, in the modern notation, given you specific pitches, G and A. But again, this depends on which uh, key you're pitching this in. So if here, Do is C, Sol would be G, Law would be A. If I were in the key of B flat, let's say that Do was B flat, Sol would be F, and Law would be G. So a single punctum, let's just sing each of these. I'll sing it first, and then you can sing it after me. Sol, we can also add a dot. A dot in pneumatic notation doubles the length. It's not like modern notation where you add only half of the original value. It actually doubles the whole value. And you see here, I've doubled it from an eighth note to a quarter note in the modern notation. Frequently, also in hymnals, you'll see a, um, an open note head without a stem, a stem, usually indicating something that's a little bit longer. So this would be... Now, a dotted punctum can either grow in volume or decrease in volume, and that depends on its point in the phrase. For example, if you are at the end of one phrase and going into the next phrase, but not taking a breath in between, your dotted punctum might sound soft at the beginning and you crescendo out of it into the next phrase. If you have a dotted punctum at the end of a phrase, for example, it's just going to be soft. Here's the next bit of notation, and these are what are called neumes. So a neum is any combination of two or more notes. Before, with the punctum, we had just a single note. This first neum is called a cleavis. And here, you read just left to right, so it would be And you notice that on this, I gave a little bit more sound to the first note rather than the second. Let's try that again. The next one is a padatus. A padatus is two notes right on top of each other. And you sing the bottom one first. You'll notice that the stem connecting the two is to the right. So here would be sola. And again, just like the clevis, I put a little bit more sound on the very first note and got a little bit lighter on the second one. This will depend, again, on your position within the phrase. But generally speaking, a rule like this helps you sing a little bit more expressively throughout. The next one, a torcolus, is three notes. You notice that in here, I've given you two different types of torcolus. One is right next to each other, and the other one, the notes are a little bit further apart. And even in the second one here, the distance between the first two notes is a third, while the distance between the second and the third note is a fourth. And so a torcolus, you will see them grouped together like this, and it's always three notes. And the middle one is the higher one. So let's look at this, sol, la, sol, la, do, sol. Sing after me. The next one is a parectus. This one is a little bit tricky to uh, identify the notes if you're unfamiliar with it, but there are three pitches here. You sing at the beginning of the swoop, the end of the swoop, and the extra note at the end. You notice here that I've started uh, giving you some tweaks to each of these neumes as well. The second parectus here has a dot on the second note. So we saw a dot connected to a punctum before, but now here it's connected to the end of a parectus. And it may or may not have this. Sing after me. And you notice here that that second law with the dot is held out just a little bit longer. 
And again, just like the other nooms, I've given a little bit of shape to the, to the overall noom. Noom comes from the Greek pneuma, which means breath or spirit. And if you think of this more so than three individual notes, but as a single breath gesture, you'll be singing it a little bit more expressively. The next noom is a skondikus. This kind of looks sometimes like a perectus with a punctum in either order, um, but they're always grouped together, three notes together. Here's the first one. The next one is a climacus, and here you see the very first note has a stem. Um, it's called a virga in Latin, and followed by two rhombic notes. A climacus can also have uh, three uh, rhombic notes, so it could be a total of four. Here I've just given you two examples with only three notes in each noom. In the second one, you'll see that there's a skip between the second and third note. This next one is a combination of two or three pitches, and there are a couple of different ways and thoughts about how to perform this. Um, the B strofa obviously has two pitches, and the tree strofa has three. You'll notice that they're on the same pitch. Two different schools of thought in how to sing this. You can rearticulate lightly each one. Or you can just hold it all the way through. So either you end up with a slight reiteration of the note in between each pit, each note, or it combines into a single long note. So again, that's or either is acceptable. And in the context of a phrase, you might find that these two different, uh, these, these nooms play two different sorts of roles. If you're in the middle of a phrase, it might be that there's a crescendo in it. If you're getting towards the end of a phrase, you might take the opportunity as you go through each of the notes to get just a little bit softer. Next, we're going to talk about a couple of markings which add expressivity to nooms. This first one is called an epithema. You'll notice that it looks kind of like a tenuto marking in modern notation. And there are a couple of keys to making expressive nooms really sound expressive. The first is that you have to land on them softly, you crescendo out of it, and you take just a slight amount of time to land softly and get louder. You don't want to think necessarily of a concrete length of the note because it will depend on the phrase and how expressively you're singing. So if you just think of those main two points, landing softly and growing louder, you kind of know intuitively about when to move on. So instead of our regular uh, cleavies here, we have, in, which would be, if I sing it expressively with the epithema, it sounds like this. Or, I'll sing the do la, sing that after me. Here is a long epithema on a torcolus. If you have a long epithema, most of the stretching usually happens on the very first note. And that first note is also where you land softly and grow. By the end of, uh, of a long epithema, it usually gets a little bit softer. So this torcolus with the epithema, instead of just sounding like would sound like this. Or, there are also a couple of uh, nooms which have expressivity built into them. This is what's called a quilisma. And you'll notice that the middle note looks like a shake. And it's actually the note before the shake that you 
make expressive. So here I've notated it in red, although in the regular score, of course, you'll just find it in black. So this would sound, instead of like, like a scondicus, it would sound like this. Or, you notice on that second one, I also added a dot. Another neum which has expressivity built into it is called a solicus. These can be the trickiest ones to spot because it kind of looks just like a punctum with a padatus. And the second note has that little mark on it. And this particular combination, it has to have that little mark on the second note, is what is called a solicus. And there are two different schools of thought as well about how to sing this one. A newer school of thought indicates that it's actually the third note, the, the highest note, which is lingered upon in this expressive zoom. In the classical Salem school, it's actually the middle note which we linger upon. And so that's what we're going to do today. There's also something called liquescence. Liquescence um, is indicated by a smaller note. And so, for example, this first thing that you see here is actually a padatus, but it's got liquescence on the second note. So it's a liquescent uh, padatus. There are a couple of other names uh, for it as well, but I don't want to give you too much terminology today. Um, and so what you do on a liquescence usually is you go to the next sound. So if you're singing something like Alleluia, and you see liquescence in there, you will end up singing something like Alleluia. The second neum here that I've given, the Do La, is a cleavis with liquescence on the second note. And then this third example that I've given you here is to be compared with the fourth example. And you see that the diamonds are just a little bit smaller than they are on the regular one, indicating that this third symbol here, this third neum, is a liquescent climacus, as opposed to the regular climacus. So how does that actually work? This is a song choose from Mass 11. Um, we're singing the Kyrie later today from Mass 11, but this is a song choose. And so if I were to sing this, it would sound like this. You notice that on the liquescent note, I closed to an N sound. Can we try that together? Here is um, something that's a little bit trickier today, and I'm giving you a lot of information so that um, you can follow up and uh, learn more. But only some of this information are we going to be using today to actually conduct. Um, this, this next thing is a little bit tricky here, and it, it will play into our rhythmic understanding later. If you have two neumes together within a single syllable, and the last note of the fir first neum and the first note of the second neum are on the same pitch, they fuse together to create what's called a presus. And you'll see that here indicated by the red note. And if I'm counting this, I have to give precedence to that first red note. It's the point of fusion, and I count that first point of fusion. This will make more sense in just a moment. A couple more things about pneumatic notation. You can extend neumes, and I've given you a couple of ways for doing that here. And there are a couple more bits of notation that are helpful to know as a conductor. Here you see the mode number, usually above a large capital at the beginning of a chant. This is in mode one. And then you see after Kyrie, an asterisk. This means that the first part, Kyrie, is sung by a cantor or a couple cantors together. And then the rest of the choir, or everybody, comes in at eleison. Next, you see IIJ. This is just a fancy way of writing the Roman numeral three. 
you can see in certain scores, especially the newer Solemn editions, where in most instances in the celebration of the Mass, the Kyrie is sung just twice. Kyrie, Kyrie, Christe, Christe, Kyrie, Kyrie. You might also see this as IJ, indicating a Roman numeral, num, numeral 2, or with the word bis, which means repeat or again. At the end of the line, you see what's called a custos. And this is a little bit of medieval genius for you. You notice it looks kind of like a cutoff note, like the coffee machine uh, had a, a, a bad day or something. But actually, what you notice is that if you look at that little note, it's showing you what the first note on the next line is. So this is saying that on the second line of music, we're going to begin with fa. A couple of other things about bar lines. You're going to see bar lines. And these correspond to grammatical breaks in the music. I've given you a little bit of information about each of these here. Something that you have to know is a quarter bar, or the smallest one that hangs out up on the upper line, is an optional breath. So you as a director can say, okay, my choir needs to breathe here, We will, and it makes musical sense to do so, so we will breathe here. If you would like them to sing through, especially if you have a larger group and they can just stagger breathe, you can have them sing through it together and only breathe together at the mandatory breath. You also have a half bar line where you breathe, but you don't add time. A full bar line, also you breathe, but you do add time. And then a double bar line usually indicates the end of a piece, or if you have a multi-sectional piece, for example, a Gloria, it can alternate between uh, groups of performers at that double bar line. Now, I've given you a lot of information today with a lot of names. And if you feel like this is a lot of information, don't be discouraged because you can teach this, you can learn it yourself and teach it to a choir without knowing every single new name right away. I would like to do just a little bit of work right now with some solfege, putting it all together and singing the Kyrie that we will end up singing and conducting later in this webinar. So if we start this together, excuse me, on la, you notice that um, the second note there is te. So if I'm reading here, I, I notice, okay, the do clef is on the top line, and I count down, space is t. The second line from the top is la. My beginning note is la, the second note being te, because when I see those two notes right on top of each other, I read the bottom one first. Let's try singing this in solfege together. This will be a little bit challenging, so we'll go a little bit slower. Feel free to breathe as many times as you need to to get through it. For many directors and choirs, singing in solfege is a challenging activity. And there are ways of building up to it instead of just diving headlong like we are right now into this in a, a compacted time frame. And uh, 
the thing about Soulfish is that it always takes a lot of startup energy, but once you get used to using it, it can be a really invaluable tool. For example, if I were starting this piece with my choir, I might have on the board the four-line staff with the do clef on top and just the notes re mi fa so la, pointing at each of them and having them sing them, just five notes in simple, predictable patterns. I might add an extra note, pe or do, something to warm them up and get the key and the mode in their head. And it will allow them, even if they're not processing and singing in solfege, when you actually sing the piece, it will help them audiate the pitches and the, the sort of harmonic environment in which this piece exists when you actually do start singing it. Let's move on to the next part of our presentation. And this is uh, an overview of the principles of the classical solemn rhythmic method. A couple of things to understand about it. It's free rhythm. It's not menstrual. That means that each note doesn't have uh, necessarily a specific time length that it lasts. And they don't necessarily relate to each other in terms of uh, fractions. Um, for example, one note being half as long or quarter as long as another note. Each note is basically equal in length. The only exceptions to this are notes that have dots, which are doubled, and notes which are expressive, which are stretched just a little bit to make the expressivity. Another principle of this solemn rhythmic method is that you group notes together in combinations of twos and threes. So you read the individual notes, then in groups of twos and threes. Then you relate groups of twos and threes together in what's called arsis and thesis. These are the conducting gestures. And then you can keep looking at the piece from a greater and greater uh, distance above. It's almost like looking at something through a telescope. Um, you can look at something really, really up close, or you can give it a little bit more space as you back away. And this is what Dom Macquerel called the greater rhythm. So that if you look at the overall piece, it sort of makes sense altogether. Everything relates to everything else. And when you're singing according to this method, you're going to see rhythmic notation, notational signs indicated in the score. Things like a dot or the episema, that horizontal line that looks like a chinudo mark, or something called an ictus. What is an ictus? An ictus is not an accent. It's kind of just like a mental construct to help you understand the sense of the music throughout time. An ictus sometimes has forward-moving energy, or it can feel like a resting point. And these are what we call an arsis or a thesis, that point of an ictus moving the energy forward in arsis, or the ictus marking a spot where Mentally, we notice this place feels like it's at rest. And we indicate this by the use of a vertical episema. So I've given you an example over in the right-hand corner. You see just a small tick mark, vertical, in each of those nooms. And we have to, when we are looking at preparing a score, divide our score into groups of twos and threes using this ictus. So where do we place the ictus? This is a hierarchical list of where you place the ictus. And you move through each point until you have the entire piece marked up in twos and threes. Today, our chant is a little bit simpler. So we're actually only going to use the first three points here. So for example, the very first thing I have to look at is where are the marked ictuses? On this Kyrie, you notice that le of eleison has an ictus. And if you noticed when we were singing it before, every time eleison comes in, it's exactly the same music. So you see that marked ictus four times here in the score. There are two other spots where we have a marked ictus. Towards the end of line one, three notes from the end, underneath that diamond-shaped note. And on line three, 
again, under one of the diamond-shaped notes towards the beginning. So now we go on to the second point, because remember, we have this list that we're mark making through, making our way through. So we looked at the marked ictus. Now we look for long notes. So anything that has a dot is a long note. Anything that has expressivity is a long note. Or the first note of a praesus is a long note. So here, you notice I've added a couple of more ictuses. For example, on A of Kyrie, each of those notes has a dot. So I indicated that with an ictus. Likewise, son at the end of every eleison has a dot. So you notice here, every note with a dot has an ictus now. There aren't any expressive notes or, or praesuses in this piece. So that makes it a little bit simpler. So again, I've looked at the marked ictuses, the long notes, and now we look at the beginning of a neum. So here I've note, notated an ictus at the beginning of each neum. So right away at the beginning of Kyrie, I have a pedatus. The very first note gets an ictus. In Ri of Kyrie, the first note gets an ictus. If you look over now at Eleison, we've got three neums together in A of Eleison. The first one is a scanditus, followed by two climacuses. And I've put an ictus on the beginning of each of these. The same thing follows with criste. And you notice that the repetition of the Kyrie on line two is the same as the very first one, so obviously it's going to look the same. And then the end of line two into line three, I've also marked the beginning of each of those uh, nooms. So what this allows me to do is to count the piece in a way that helps me phrase it well. I will demonstrate the very first Kyrie, and then we'll try it together. Every time that I placed an ictus, I sang one. Sometimes I kept counting only up to two, and sometimes I counted up to three. And I have enough ictuses now in this piece to have the entire thing marked out in groups of two and three. So I'm able to count sing the entire thing. Let's try it together. Ready? Repeat. If I look at the Christe, I can also count sing this. I'll demonstrate first and then we'll try together twice. Let's try it together twice.
The next part, the Kyrie, is the same as the first one. So let's do that twice through, and then we'll go into the very final Kyrie at the end of line two, all the way through line three. So again, we're starting in the middle of line two, repeating that Kyrie twice, and then going on into the very end of line two into line three. Ready? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Repeat. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, go on. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. The trickiest thing when you start doing this might be for you singing in groups of three. Sometimes it's easy to get the twos going, especially if you have several of them in a row. The threes might throw you for a loop. One of the things that helps me, and I encourage singers to do, is to move along with the music. Sometimes if we get the rhythm into our bodies, it's a little bit easier to feel how it goes. And you're going to feel that especially when it comes to conducting. You really have to have the rhythm in your body. So good score preparation really involves singing the piece over and over so that you can feel like you can sing it well. And it becomes more of a part of you. And then it's easier for you to express it in terms of your conducting. One other bit of uh, timing is what we do in between. You notice that we have quarter bars. For example, between Kyrie and Eleison on the first line. And then after Eleison, we have a double bar. And what do we do there? Well, it can depend on what groups you have singing it. For example, if you have a group of cantors singing all the way through Kyrie Eleison, and then everyone repeats, you might not think too much about the time in between. Or you could even just go straight on between the two groups. But if you have the same people singing at repetitions through that double bar line, you're going to have to think about adding a little bit of time. And we're going to have to do that today because you're going to be singing the entire thing. So right at every double bar line, we will add just two counts of rest. So it will sound like this at the end of Lay Song. One, two, one, two, rest. One, two, one, two. But when it comes to the quarter bar lines, Kyrie Eleison, right there in the middle, we won't add any time. And once you get this faster, you probably won't even need to breathe there. Let's talk about conducting now. Here is your basic chironomic gesture. It looks like an infinity sign. Your ictus, or one, is at the bottom of each loop of the gesture. The loop on the left is at the center of your body, and the loop on the right is out towards the outside of your body. So you see this is a conducting curve for a right hand. If it were for your left hand, it would just be opposite this in a mirror image. Here's a little video that explains some of the basics of this chironomic gesture. The right foot goes slightly in front of the left foot. Arms go out with palms facing nearly down at a natural angle, arms out at about 110 degrees. You can conduct either with two arms or with just a single arm. I'll demonstrate today with both arms. The arsis circle starts down and comes across the body and then rises up and the thesis goes out, and makes a smaller loop and then comes up. So again, that's arsis, thesis, arsis, thesis. You notice all this time I'm kind of leading with my wrist and then I relax my wrist. Let's try this in groups of two. We'll do it four times on each arsis 
and thesis. Ready? Go. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. R, sis, the, sis. R, sis, the, sis. Stop. Now let's try it in groups of three. To make the group of three, you might move a little bit more slowly or make the gesture just a little bit more tall to give room for the group of three so that your one is always at the bottom of the gesture. Let's try that together. And one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. R, sis, and the, sis, and R, sis, and the, sis, and stop. So as you notice, the thesis loop is really much smaller than the arsis. This slide here is a little bit misleading in, in terms of that. Sometimes you can give a large gesture on the thesis, especially if you're trying to bring people in on a breath into the arsis. But really, it's much smaller. So again, just a few basic points. You really want fluidity in the wrist. And if you imagine, for example, that you're conducting underwater, and you have some resistance against your arm, this will help you get a more correct approach to it. And it should be always moving. Your arm should never stop moving. In terms of where the ictus lies in the hand, it's really when the fingers touch the bottom of the gesture. Something else that you want to think about is how do you cut people off, for example, especially with an S or other consonant voiced consonant or unvoiced consonant, you can use a cutoff that's it's just familiar with you uh, and your choir. You don't have to think of anything necessarily very fancy. And when we get to these other gestures, you're going to see that I add a breath in the beginning of some of them, and you can just do that by going straight up. Later on, um, a more sophisticated thing you want to think about is how to add the breath as part of a thesis gesture in between, in the middle of a piece. But today we'll concentrate just on that breath at the beginning. Don't let your gesture get too high so that you um, are always encouraging diaphragmatic breathing and support from the diaphragm. If your gesture gets too high, it's going to help uh, uh, make singers feel like the, the sound is coming primarily, support for the sound rather, is coming primarily from their throat rather from, than from the diaphragm. And if you make your gesture too large, as is a common temptation when we're working with children's choirs, it can actually make people stop looking at you less, and you gain, uh, you, you lose control over the expressivity in your, in your choral singing. So I'd encourage you to not get too big. Remember, an arsis or thesis can have either two or three counts in it. And the trick in this kind of uh, conducting method is that each piece presents its own combination of arsis and thesis and groups of twos and threes. And now let's try some exercises that demonstrate this. This is, um, you're going to see uh, diagrams like this that are kind of just an illustration of what your right hand would look like if you were doing this in the air. This is one arsis where it goes over the top of the curve, and the thesis is the, the lower part of the curve. And then it comes back into an arsis and a thesis. In this next part, we will take a gesture of one arsis, one thesis, one arsis, one thesis. Remember to stand shoulder width apart with your right foot slightly in front of your left foot so that you can go up towards the ball of your feet and settle back. Arms out, and we will start each group of gestures with a breath where you can just go up and then you come across for the arsis. We will do each combination four times, and on this first time through, we'll do it for two counts in each gesture. Let's begin. Breath and one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Two. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Arsis, thesis. 
is R, sis, E, sis. Last time, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, rest. Let's try a couple of other combinations. This one is arsis with two theses. When you have multiple theses in a row, it will be just like your hands are going up and down on a wave. In this next set, we will combine one arsis with two theses. We will do each gesture for two counts each. Arms out, begin with a two beat breath. One, two, arsis, the, sis, the, sis. R, sis, the, sis, the, sis. R, sis, the, sis, the, sis. R, sis, the, sis, the, sis. Rest. Let's try the next combination. Two RCs, two theses. This next combination will be two RCs and two theses. When you make two RCs in a row, they build on top of each other and the second circle is slightly higher than the first circle. And remember, in the theses, it's just like a wave going out, but don't get out too far. We will have a two beat breath at the beginning and then each combination four times through, counting two beats on each gesture. Ready? One, two. R, sis, R, sis, the, sis, the, sis. R, sis, R, sis, the sis the sis r sis r sis the sis the sis r sis r sis the sis the sis rest here's the next combination three rc's and one thesis this next combination uses the maximum number of rc's three rc's followed by one thesis. Let's do each for a count of two, with a two beat breath at the beginning. One, two, 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 one, two. R, sis, R, sis, R, sis, the, sis. R, sis, R, sis, R, sis, the, sis, rest. You notice on that one that as I did each R, sis, the circle actually got a little bit larger. And you notice that I leaned into the ball of my foot. And this is a way of giving more and more energy because the second R, sis should have just a little more energy than the first, and the third just a little more than the second. Here's a combination gesture. Let's try this one. This next combination combines many of the things we've been working on. We'll do two arses, two thesis, arses, thesis, arses, thesis. Two counts on each gesture with a two beat breath at the beginning. And one, two. Arses, arses, thesis, thesis. Arses, thesis. R sis the sis R sis R sis the sis the sis R sis the sis R sis the sis one two 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 one last time R sis R sis the sis the sis R sis the sis R sis the sis rest. On this next slide, I've given you a number of exercises. We're not going to go through all of them for time's sake, but here is a demonstration of exercise 1A. On this next slide, I've given you a number of exercises you can try on your own after this webinar is over. Let's do the first one together. It's a combination of arsis, thesis, arsis, thesis, followed by another set of arsis, thesis, arsis, thesis. The first four gestures are worth two, and the last four gestures are worth three, and then we repeat the entire thing. A two beat breath at the beginning. One, two, 
One, two. R, sis, he, sis. R, sis, he, sis. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, one. And repeat. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. R, sis, and he, sis, and R, sis, and he, sis, and rest. This next slide, again, you'll have access to it after this webinar is completed. I've given you just another exercise here. Let's go on to the rules for knowing when to sing in arsis and when to sing in thesis. And we'll apply this to the Kyrie that we've already solfeged and counted. Here's the first combination of rules, points one and two here. An arsis is always at the beginning of each phrase. So that means after a full bar line, or a double bar line. You're always going to have an arsis. A lot of times you also have an arsis following a half bar line. And at the end of the phrase, a thesis. So again, arsis at the beginning, thesis at the end. So the energy is at the beginning of the phrase, all the way throughout the phrase, and then it comes to a peaceful conclusion. Also, the second point is points three and four here. When the melody goes up, arsis. When the melody goes down, Sometimes you're going to see that these rules compete against each other and you have to make an artistic decision about which one applies. This next point here, bullet point number five, if you have a peak note of a melodic gesture which descends immediately afterwards, it gets an arsis. So for example, if you look at this Kyrie in eleison, you notice a figure that looks kind of like a mountain. At the top of the mountain, that ictus there with the climacus on te, la, sol is a descending melodic gesture. So it seems like, according to our rules, it would be a thesis. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. The peak of a melodic gesture is usually where the most energy lies. So in this case, at the top of the peak, we give an arsis. And then, uh, the, one of the next rules is at the last syllable of a word, we use a thesis, at least for the first ictus of that last syllable. You want usually no more than three arses in a row. Some books say four, and you can add as many theses as necessary, although there are some things you can do to keep your gesture more centered so you don't end up with your arms too far out. So you notice here, I've given you the conducting for Curie from Mass, mass 11. And so if I were to sing it, I'm just telling you when the arsis and thesis is, it would sound like this. So when the line goes above the note, it's arsis. When the line goes below the note, Now this is going to take a little bit of practice. And I've broken it down into uh, an exercise that you can try. So if I look here, if I wanted to just sing Kyrie, that's the first line here. Arsis for two, thesis for two, thesis for two, thesis for two. A liaison would be that next line starting with the arsis for three. Let's practice just the very first line of this. Get your position ready. Breathe and arsis, thesis, 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 rest. Start again. Breathe and arsis, thesis, 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 rest. Now let's add the eleison in there. That starts in the second line. A arsis for three, arsis for three, thesis for three. A small arsis for two, that's why it's in lowercase, because it's so low in the range, I made that a smaller arsis, and the thesis for two. So treat it just like this exercise. Rest and arsis, thesis, thesis, thesis. Arsis and arsis and thesis and arsis, thesis, rest.
Now, you might want to practice this a couple of times before you try going all the way through it. One of the best things you can do when you're starting to, to conduct something is to conduct something that you've already sung a lot, that feels like it's already part of your body so that you don't get so frustrated about whether your hand goes to the center or to the outside or you get wrapped up in the, the complexities of the rhythm. Take this broken down exercise and then when you're ready, apply it in this whole video that we're going to see next. I'll demonstrate here how the whole thing looks together. Let's conduct the entire carrie from Mass 11 all the way through. We'll begin with a two beat breath and each breath in between the repetitions will be two beats. Now, one of the toughest things also about beginning to conduct is knowing where the arsis and thesis goes, just looking at the score. So let me break it down a little bit more com uh, completely for you um, just in our remaining minutes together. One of our rules was arsis at the beginning of phrase and thesis at the end. So you see that the first two notes of Kyrie have an arsis, and then at the end of eleison, the line goes under and it's the thesis. Now, ri of Kyrie the pitches descend, so I put a thesis there. A has two notes, each ictus has a thesis there, because it neither goes up nor down, but it is the last syllable in the word. And remember, on the last syllable, it should be more thesis than arsis, so that a, a last syllable, which is never accented in Latin, feels like it has a little bit more rest. A of eleison, descent or us ascends rather at the very beginning of it so i give that an arsis that peak point that we talked about also gets an arsis because it has a lot of energy and the third ictus in a of eleison descends so i give that a thesis lei goes up but it's really low in the range so you want to make sure that at this arsis it's very small on the word Christe, I'm starting a new phrase, so I have an arsis at the beginning. Ge, the first note, is high, and you might think that, oh, I need a lot of energy to get that. But it's the last syllable in, in, a lot, in this Greek word, which is in our Latinate pronunciation, also never accented. So I give it a thesis. 
The next group goes up, do, re, and then goes back down. So it does both, and since it's so high in the range, I gave it an arse to give that support for it. The last three notes in the, in the line, there are two ictuses there. The second and third notes from the end are descending, so I give it a thesis. And that single uh, dotted punctum at the end of the line feels more restful, so I also give that a thesis. You'll want to come back to this and try thinking through it for yourself, what goes where, so that when you apply it to a new chant, you can think more critically about it. And then you can look at these videos following just to try it. A couple tips and tricks. One of the best things about this type of conducting is that you're not conducting every single note. A lot of times we want to give a clear pattern to our singers. When we try conducting too much, we overconduct, and we lose some of the phrasing. What you're going to notice is that as you sing and conduct in this style, with energy towards the center of the body and the, uh, the rest towards the outer part of the body, is that you're naturally going to know when to get louder and when to get softer. And those sorts of things, you can train your singers to feel them with you. For example, uh, you might uh, just try singing it a couple of times and have them memorize something and look at you or perhaps even move with you as they try singing it. And you're going to find that when your energy is centered in the body, there is just a naturally louder sound versus when it's dissipated towards the outside of the body, uh, towards away from the center of the body, that it's much easier to be softer. I would avoid showing pitch with the raising or the lowering of hand. Sometimes that's a temptation. And here, all you're doing is basically conducting the phrasing. One of the best things you can do, especially with uh, be, uh, when you're beginning conducting chant in this way, is to use this with more familiar or memorized chants. It'll be easier for you, and your singers will have a better chance of seeing what you're actually doing because they'll, their heads will be out of the score. Make sure bigger gestures for louder sounds, smaller for softer. And can you sing it as expressively as needed? That's an important part of score preparation. One other thing that you might think of doing is teaching your choir how to um, look at you a little bit more, how to hold the shoulder away from the body, and to fixate their eyes alternating between the music and you. And one last thing you might think of doing, I've used this in a lot of my children's choirs, is something akin to a medieval choir book. There's a, a website called blockposters.com, and you can upload an image file of a chant or any piece of music that you're working on so that your singers can uh, see all from the same giant sheet. The, the website asks you if you'd like to, how many pages wide and tall you would like to make it, and you kind of cut and paste it together. And then you can point at it during rehearsal. And this will help them learn how to read notation. A couple of resources for further study. There's this book, uh, The Technique of Gregor Gregorian Chironomy, available on the Church Music Association of America's website for free or you can buy it through the CMAA, and the Gregorian Chant Practicum by Justine Ward, available through CUA Press. Also, during the summer, I'll be offering a course here at St. Joseph Seminary in Yonkers for three credits, and you can audit it or take it for credit. And there's some more information at my website. And finally, one of the other things that I would recommend to you is the Ward Method. It was developed in the 1920s by a Catholic convert, Justine Ward, and it has as its core the rhythmic method of the classical solemn method that I explained to you today. And it's a great comprehensive music education method, which involves movement, improvisation, reading, ear training, all those sorts of things. So that's it. I'm ready for questions. I know we ran a little bit over 5 o'clock. And uh, feel free, even after the webinar, if you'd like to email me and get in touch, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, Jenny, uh, we did get a few questions through the Q&A um, widget. Uh, the first one is, how does one determine what key a chant is written in? Yeah, that's a great question. It depends on the range of your singers. For young singers, as I mentioned, uh, you would probably want to avoid going 
below about a C sharp or C as really the lower end of, of the range. So it depends on the solfege in the chant. So for example, if you look at a chant, you can ask what's the lowest solfege pitch and what's the highest? Okay. Um, the next one is... Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to finish up that. Um, oh, and then base it so that whatever your lowest solfege pitch is um, at the, a low, comfortable range that children can produce well, and that the highest note isn't, isn't too high. And pick a key where uh, whatever do makes that pitch range possible. Okay. Uh, is there a site with flashcards to drill the the names of the, the nooms and notation that you've given us? I'm not aware of one, but I'd love it if someone invented one. Um, there might be... Um, <laughs> uh, I would Google around. I, I, I vaguely remember someone making this... Um, but I can't recall off the top of my head where it's available. Okay, uh, the next one is if IIJ means repeat, what does just IJ mean? That's just the Roman numeral two, so you would repeat it just once. So it's, um, if you see uh, IIJ, okay. you sing the music three times. If you see IJ, you sing it twice. Okay. Um, is all chant felt in three or just the particular Kyrie you presented? It's just the particular Kyrie I presented. Um, and you notice that there were also, also twos in there. So it's, again, it's a free rhythm and it has a combination of twos and threes. And those twos and threes relate at higher and higher levels. But it, again, it's, it's uh, particular to the, each individual composition. Um, okay, how would one mark an ictus on chants that use modern notation? Um, you could do it the same way, just a, a, a small vertical mark. Um, one of the limitations of the, the chant um, uh, notation software that I was using is that I couldn't put the ictus on top of the notes. Um, and I find that actually when I'm writing them in by hand, I put the ictus either on the top or the bottom depending on what's easiest to see, whatever makes it most visible to me. Okay. Um, the next one is, let's see, oh, what software do you use when you're writing chant on your computer? For this, um, I used uh, GABC or Gregorio. Um, there's a web interface. It's it's a, a software that you can install on your computer, but it's a little bit above my pay grade in, <laughs> in complexity for how to do that. Um, so a kind soul has created a web interface. So if you Google GABC Gregorio chant notation, it will take you to a chant inscriber on GitHub, and I use that almost exclusively. You'll find uh, you can mess around with the, the notation for a little bit, but it's pretty intuitive that you have the text um, and you syllabify it, so you just have one syllable of text and it's followed by a closed set of parentheses and in the parentheses are where you put the notes and the notation. Um, one of our, one of the attendees uh, mentioned there's a workbook with all the nooms um, listed there and it's called Gregorian Chant for Kids. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, I think resource, that's, that's, that's that might be what comment. I was thinking of. That might be what I was thinking of. I, I okay. just can't recall what it is off the top of my head. Okay, and it looks like it's available on Amazon just for um, everyone's edification. Um, let's see. Um, we'll take one more. Um, does arsis and thesis have anything to do with higher notes and lower notes, respectively? Um, I know you covered this this briefly, um, how you decide whether you're going to, to use an arsis or a thesis. 
That's a great question. And for example, in the chant that we were doing, the Christe, as I mentioned, has um, a high note, um, the first note of stay. And um, it would seem that you could use an arsis there if you really needed to support the singing of, this, of the singers. But it has a really lovely effect, actually, if you sing it with a thesis. So in general, you can use sort of principles that you would in normal score study. If, that, if something is high and needs more support, you might give it more RCs. And if it's lower, it um, uh, might have more CCs. Or if there is an RCs on a really low pitch, that it might be just a, a, a little bit of energy and not quite as much energy as if it were a really high note. Okay, one, one last question has come in. Um, with larger choirs, how do you move away from a um, mensuralist ideal and help to sing more freely? Um, I think this conducting technique is a, a great way of doing that because you're not indicating each individual note and you don't have a regularity with where your ictuses occur. That's the whole point behind the solemn um, rhythmic approach, that it's a free rhythmic approach. And um, really the rhythm is based on the phrasing and, and how one fuels the phrase and moves it along. Um, and this is, this is a really uh, great way to encourage people to sing and to sing expressively, that it, it feels like you know when to crescendo and when to decrescendo, and uh, you're not worried so much with um, how each note necessarily relates to one another in terms of time, but more in terms of dynamic and its place within the phrase. Okay, that concludes our time for questions for today. If we didn't get to your question, we will forward those to the presenter via email so she can respond to you directly. If you have not done so already, you can download your certificate of attendance for this webinar from the certific certification widget in your toolbar. Thanks to our audience for your active participation today, and thank you, Jenny, for all that you have shared with us. Did you have any final words for the audience today? Thank you very much for coming, um, and uh, I hope that you found this helpful and that you know where to go from here. It's a lot of information, and uh, but you can do it if you break these things down and keep practicing them and coming back to these exercises and just build on them um, in your natural musicianship. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jenny. Before we conclude today's webinar, I invite you all to visit our website at nca.org to see listings for both upcoming webinars and professional development activities. As a reminder, you will be getting this on-demand recording to view or share via email within 24 hours. Thank you all again, and may you enjoy a blessed evening.